Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I want to start by uh, thanking Tinsley for the incredible opportunity to come here and spend a couple of days with all of you and, uh, and uh, be able to, to talk to you about our work. It's truly an honor for me to be here, and I've enjoyed uh, yesterday and this morning immensely um, and learned a lot of uh, new things. So Tinsley asked me to talk to you about uh, computational um, engineering and science and what it is doing for, uh, for materials. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. The service here is fantastic. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, but but before, I, uh, before I begin, I just want to get this one thing out of the way, address the elephant in the room. Uh, I'm from Michigan, and I just want to say that we're over it. We're over the 2005 Rose Bowl with the spectacular yet devastating loss by one point at the end to the Longhorns. And we, so we've moved past it, and I'm, I am happy to be here. Um, it is often said that, that materials define uh, civilizations, and from the, the Stone Age to the Bronze Age to the Iron Age, the Plastic Age, and the, the no, one, no one recognizes that? No? I got no left. The Graduate? Plastics? Okay. Uh, and the Silicon Age, um, the materials that we have uh, at, our, at our fingertips define what we're able to do as, as a civilization and even helps to, and, and even serves to define uh, our aspirations for where we want our civilization to go. Now we're in the Silicon Age, and the Silicon Age is, uh, is a particularly interesting one because it is through the use of silicon and computing that we are, uh, we are driving ourselves into, the, into this new age where uh, not only will, the, will our civilization be, continue to be devi defined by these new materials, but the computers are going to define um, new materials. And for the first time, we really can start to imagine a future where we can have materials that do whatever we want, in whatever way we want, at, you know, in, in, for, for any purpose, um, materials that uh, mimic the octopus, for example, that can change their, their colors and blend in with the environment. Um, uh, lightweight aircraft, uh, shape-shifting, morphing materials, biological implants uh, that make us stronger and, and faster and healthier, biomimetic materials, smart materials that act like the brain, energy-efficient uh, materials that can change um, uh, the way that they interact with their, uh, the, with their environment uh, for energy efficiency. We can start to imagine all sorts of materials, and when we see what's going on around us in the area of additive manufacturing, and we bring together a lot of the breakthroughs that, that, I'll, that I'll talk about, um, it, it really becomes possible to imagine uh, at the age of materials on, on demand. So one approach to this age of materials on demand and how to make new materials with new properties is through uh, self-assembly, or what I like to call assembly engineering, uh, which is the design and, and, and synthesizing building blocks and processes to self-assemble into structures with, uh, with the desired materials properties. So yesterday we heard a lot from, from Jose about um, Protein folding. Protein folding is, is an example of an assembly problem where you have amino acids that are, con, that are constrained to lie in one dimension along a chain and they fold up into their native state. And, but, and that's a self-assembly problem where the, the protein has to figure out how to, on its own, self-assemble into the structure. Um, in assembly engineering, we want to start with building blocks. They could be atoms or molecules or larger particles, and that's what I'm going to focus on in a bit, um, that have the properties that we want them to have, and we put them together um, and, and, and get the, the kind of structures that we want. To be able to do that, the processes that we define have to be scalable. We have to be able to understand exactly what our building blocks are, how they interact with each other, how they can come together with high yield in a reproducible way, um, with very high quality, with you know few defects, and in a way that's affordable. Um, and so, just to give you an example, if if you look back at the really the first 10 to 12 years of the National Nanotechnology Initiative, which started in, in say 
officially in 1998, really started kicking off in 2000. The field of nanoscience, which is contributed to by, you know, by material scientists and, and chemists, chemical engineers, physicists, electrical engineers, um, has been to make new kinds of building blocks that are anywhere from a nanometer to a micron in size um, that, uh, that can act as the atoms and molecules, the building blocks of, of tomorrow's materials. And so there are, I do have a pointer here, I forgot that. Um, if you, if you, this is just a snapshot taken from the literature of this incredible, uh, incredibly diverse array of building blocks that are possible out of virtually any materials now, metals, uh, uh, ceramics, plastics, hybrids of multiple kinds of materials. They can be made now on all of these different scales. They can be made um, in, 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 in a variety of shapes, virtually any shape um, that, you, that you can imagine um, can, can, can now be made. Um, and not only that, but these, these nano-sized building blocks can be further functionalized. They can be coated with organic molecules, with biological molecules. Uh, we can put DNA on them. We can put proteins on them. We can imbue them with specific interactions so that they come together like a lock and key with other building blocks. And so we can start to think about this, this palette of possible building blocks that if we knew how to design them right, they could self-assemble into structures that we want that have uh, interesting new, uh, new properties. So, so what's the challenge? That sounds like a very exciting opportunity. The challenge is that we know virtually nothing about how these kinds of materials assemble. What we do know is that for these nanoparticles, which are grown in, in, in solution, they, they may have a naturally faceted shape or some other sort of shape. They can be in water or in different kinds of solutions. And we know that what will drive the assembly of these building blocks is just like Jose's proteins, um, is thermodynamics and the tendency to want to minimize the, the free energy of the system. So the system wants to ha find that, 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 that sweet spot where it, where it, where it, it is thermodynamically stable, um, and it can get stuck in all sorts of, of metastable traps. Sometimes those metastable traps themselves are interesting structures and might be structures that we want to have. So we do understand something about the thermodynamics, but we don't know how to predict for any given specific system, just give me a building block, I cannot tell you what is the structure that it will self-assemble into. We can't start with a target structure that we know we want for a particular property and say, oh, I know what kind of building block to make. If you make these they will self-assemble into that, into that structure. And that's what we have to understand. We know very little, we, we know the kinds of forces that are, uh, that are driving the assembly of particles into, into structures. We know that there are the usual kinds of Van der Waals interactions and electrostatics and, and uh, you know, solvophobic, solvophilic interactions. We know that there's entropy involved, especially in these kinds of self-assembling systems, just like in in, in proteins, but we don't necessarily know the specific information about how strong all of these different forces are for you know, all of these different kinds of building blocks in all of these different situations. Um, kinetics, I mentioned, is a, is, is a, is a problem in under, you know, predicting when the system will get trapped, will get stuck, or will go into another uh, uh, equilibrium state that's, that's only metastable, that's only temporary, uh, but might have an, have an interesting structure. And so just in the same way that one looks at proteins through protein funnels and tries to understand those assembly pathways, the field of assembly engineering is looking at um, uh, understanding the assembly pathways by how these particles want to come together. And we know virtually nothing about that process right now. Um, we need design rules. Um, that's where all of this is going to. If we had design rules, then we could say, okay, make, make this, make it this way, and they'll form these, these sorts of, 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 of structures. So I think about assembly engineering in the same way that, that chemical engineers think about reaction engineering, where in reaction engineering we design uh, uh, you know, reactants, molecules, that will, that will react to, to, to yield products, and there's, there's, uh, there's many uh, steps, perhaps, in the, in the reaction uh, in, in the reaction pathway, we design the processes that will that will optimize um, the product, optimize the yields, optimize the quality. Here we're trying to do the same thing, only not necessarily with chemical reactions, but with assembly of of, of nano sized objects. So, what the real problem is, and where computer simulation 
comes into play and why it's such a great time to be a simulator is that there really is a nearly infinite possible uh, d design space. Um, there, uh, if you just imagine all the things that you could do with, the, with nanoparticles where you can change their, their coatings, you can change their aspect ratio, you can change the faceting. These, these many nanoparticles are grown as crystals in solution, so they're naturally faceted, just like minerals and, and, and gemstones. And, uh, and by controlling the growth processes of these little nanocrystals and the ligands that absorb onto the surface to arrest the growth, it's possible to get certain facets to express and, and, and others to be, um, to be suppressed. And, uh, and so one can, can, can change the shape of these particles as they grow. We can change the way that, the, the, that ligands or DNA or proteins are, are coated on the surface of these particles. So we can make all kinds of patchy particles. Um, there's, there's a number of different uh, what we like to call anisotropy dimensions. These are all individual attributes, knobs, if you will, that you can imagine tuning in order to change the way that particles interact with each other. And once you change how they interact with each other, then you change all the different assembled structures that, that could be possible. Um, and then, you know, if you were to try to do this experimentally, it, you know, it would be impossible to try every single possibility. Just making a new formulation in the lab can take a lot of time, a lot of graduate students, um, a, a lot of money. Computer simulation with the right models uh, and with enough computer power is in the position now to rapidly go through all of these different possibilities. We can take our codes and, um, and tune along different dimensions independently in a way that, that experiment can, cannot. I can change the coding without the shape, or I can change the shape without the coding and see what the effects are. I can combine different anisotropy dimensions um, together and start to map out a, a phase space of possibilities so that I can then say to my experimentalist colleagues, make this, make these over here. This is where the interesting assembled structures are possible. Um, and so, I'm sure you've heard uh, about the Materials Genome Initiative, a White House initiative that started just a, a couple of years ago, and which, which I, can, I can say with certainty exists today because of the work that Tinsley Oden started back in the, in, in the middle 2000s um, in, in proselytizing what simulation-based engineering and science um, can do for the country. And the focal point in, with respect to materials and being able to accelerate the time to market for new materials um, to cut that, that time, uh, uh, you know, in, 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 in half um, is, is really what's behind the Materials Genome Initiative. So where we're going with this is if we could understand all of these different attributes and how they conspire to, uh, to drive new structures, then we're really talking about a periodic table of nano building blocks, just like, like Henry this morning talked about the, a periodic table of, 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 uh, of neuromorphologies. We can start thinking about replacing all of these elements of the, the atomic elements of the periodic table with nanoparticles and, of course, get a much higher dimensional space uh, of possibility. So is the computing capability there yet for us to be able to do that? And, and, and I am here to argue that, yes, it is. Um, and so here's a chart. It's kind of an older chart now, but this shows uh, gigaflops possible on the, the planet's fastest computer, supercomputer, as a function of year. And, uh, and it shows different sort of eras. Um, and Dan, Dan Stanzioni t touched on some of these yesterday. I keep talking on in this thing. Um, and uh, so, for example, here at this star, this is, this is what I did my, my PhD thesis on right there. Um, at that speed about a, of about a teraflop on this uh, connection machine CM2, CM5, which is the first computer I ever programmed, was a, was, a, was a parallel computer. So Dan was talking yesterday about how students today are still learning how to, para, how to, how to program serially, and that's not going to help us with, with many core. But back then, we actually started <laughs> by learning how to program parallel computers first. Um, and as we've kind of now flipped that around. This is the computer that you may remember from Jurassic Park in the control room of Jurassic Park was a CM5 connection machine. So now we've got, we, we go from the vector machines to the massively parallel era, and now we're in the many core era of, uh, uh, that Dan talked about yesterday, putting many, many cores on a single chip, and in particular, this is really exploited by, um, by graphics processors. And, and I would say that graphics processors or GPUs are, are truly a disruptive um, revolution. 
and uh, they are changing, at least in my lab, they literally changed overnight what we're able to do and what we're able to predict and how fast we're able to predict it. And just to, to show you a little bit of why, um, if you look, the, so the two charts on the right show um, as a function of time, the compute speed and the memory speed for GPUs and CPUs. And you can see that this, the, the CPU line, as Dan showed yesterday, has been relatively flat, just in, you know, in cranking up the clock speed, we can only go so much, and then you have to put many CPUs together. But if you look at a single GPU, the GPU curve is going like this. And so this is screaming up, this is, this is the, the, the t new Tesla K40, which is just a tweak on the, on the previous Kes, te, um, Tesla K20, and so that's why it's down here, but the next one's gonna be about up here, when the Maxwell trip comes out. Um, and you could see this enormous difference, okay? If you look at, um, uh, at the Tesla K K40, there's 2,880 cores, seven billion transistors on a single chip. Well, I can do one and a half teraflops of double precision, or over four teraflops, uh, single precision, which is actually good enough for a lot of different, different problems. Um, you get uh, um, all of this in a thing that's like this big that you can buy at Radio Shack, a smaller version of it, for a few hundred dollars. So this is one of the reasons why this is so disruptive. Talk about a supercomputer in the palm of your hand. Um, and so what that means to us is if I look back just a few years, like the previous generation of graduate students and now the new generation of graduate students in my group, what took 140 days, a computation before, um, now takes 27 hours uh, by writing, by taking our, what, whatever was the fastest code that was possible to run on the fastest CPU and now rewriting it, especially for these GPUs, um, to run as fast as, as, as possible, right? So this is really eking out the bits, but this is, what, this is a, a, an enormous change for us. So uh, there are two uh, of, of several workhorse types of, of um, uh, simulation codes that are used in studying self-assembly of nanoparticles, um, molecular dynamics, and Monte Carlo simulations, and these are things that have focused on the particles and calculate the forces between the particles or the energies between, between the particles to, uh, to allow the, the system to figure out what is the best configuration that minimizes that, the, the free energy and becomes thermodynamically stable. And so in, uh, for, for molecular dynamics, we wrote a code in, uh, that we develop as open source community code in our group. It was downloaded about 2,500 times last year. We have a growing open source community. Um, we can do four, 5 billion force calculations, 66 million particle updates a second. It's 160 times faster than if we optimized our code on, uh, on the Intel Xeon chip. We get 23 times better performance per dollar and, and 11 uh, a factor of 11 less energy usage. So that's a big deal. It's also a big deal to my university who pays a lot of money for power and cooling of, uh, of these large supercomputers. Um, Monte Carlo is something, is a, is, a, is a kind of algorithm that's not inherently parallel like molecular dynamics. In molecular dynamics, you're solving Newton's equations over and over and over. F equals ma, take two particles, what's the force that this particle exerts on this one, and all the other particles it exerts on this one and you figure out how to accelerate, and you do it over and over and over and over. With Monte Carlo, you, you, you grab a particle or a few particles at, at, at random, and you figure out if I were to do this or move it this way or move, turn it that way, what's the change in energy in the system, and if it's favorable, then you do it, and if, you, if it's not, then you do it stochastically. So it's a different way of exploring all of the possible phase space available to the system. It's not naturally inherently parallel, but we figured out how to parallelize it for GPUs. And we're getting an enormous speed up that I never would have dreamed possible. And we can do over a billion trial moves a second. And again, we get this incredibly better performance than we could ever do by really optimizing good code on, on a CPU. And so what that means is that for us, overnight, we are dumping you know, 100 terabytes of data. So the students are like, this is great. We, our code runs 100, 120 times faster than it did yesterday. So now they're dumping hundreds of terabytes of data and saying, where do we put it? So it shifted the problem, but that's an opportunity. So to give you an example of what we can do now with all of this, um, this compute 
compute power. Here's just, just one example. This is a recent study that we did jointly with our, our colleagues, uh, my, with my colleague um, Chris Murray at the University of Pennsylvania. Chris is one of the, the leaders in the field of nanoscience in making and assembling uh, nanoparticles. And, 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 uh, and he can make them of all sorts of different shapes. Typically, he uses the rare earth, um, the kinds of assemblies that he makes. Um, he's very interested in for, uh, for information storage, for tailoring electronic transport, photoconductivity, um, magnetic exchange coupling for new solid state materials and devices. And so they make these particles. They dry them out on a grid. They get some kind of pattern like this one on the left or this one on the right, which are two different problems for very similarly shaped particles. And they come to us and say, why are these forming these patterns? We don't know anything about the thermodynamics of the system. We're, we think there's these forces. We're not sure we can measure these, but we can't measure those. But we don't understand why sometimes we get this pattern and sometimes we get that pattern. And that's just one example of dozens and dozens of other types of nanoparticle systems and, and dozens of groups that we're working with that have similar kinds of challenges where they can make particles, they get stuff, but we don't understand how, so we don't know how to work backwards and design from the properties and structures that we want. And so with computer simulation, of course, we can go through and say, well, you have a slight change in the particle shape. This, this one on the right is a little longer than, than this one on the left. Even though you made them exactly the same way with the same ligands, this one grew a little longer in this direction. And that's, you know, so, so we know that that's different about them. And then we can go through with our different knobs and we can study the effect of changing the shape and, and look at what happens and be able to figure out what the phase diagram of this is, what the design rules are. We can, we we can show that, in fact, when you get to this particular aspect ratio, then the ligand binding density on one edge is different than on the other edge, and that promotes uh, a, a, an unlike binding between different edges, whereas on the left it promotes a like binding on, on the edges. So the details are, 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 are not so important, but what it shows us is that really subtle features in, in shape and the coating on the particles can give rise to different sorts of structures, and that's exactly what we want to be able to control and, and to design. So just like we heard about this morning from this phenomenal talk by Henry Markham, um, like the brain, only a minute portion of the possible structures have been discovered to date, but, but things are changing fast. Um, and so let me just give you uh, some examples of what, one of the things that we've discovered by just isolating the role of shape, which is something that simulations can do in a way that experiments can't. Experiments can't easily just turn off the forces. Yes, they can control salt concentration, they can screen long-range interactions, they can control Hamaker constants to control different forces in the, in the system, but it's very difficult to tune one, independent, tune one knob independently of another knob. And so here's an example of just how, uh, what, what kinds of surprises are in store. Back in 2007, 2008, we, we, we were studying um, self-assembly of nanoparticles with my colleague, Nick Kotoff, at the University of Michigan, just next door to me, um, down in, in my hallway. And, uh, and he makes a little uh, CAD telluride, CAD selenide nanoparticles that are about a nanometer and a half on an edge, and, um, and they're basically tetrahedrally shaped. And we had studied all kinds of situations where sometimes he would get them to form sheets, and sometimes they'd make them and they'd form twisted ribbons, and sometimes they'd make super aggregates that all had the same size. And we were trying to understand how all the different forces were conspired. And at some point we said, you know, what is just the role of shape of these particles? The one thing that really jumps out at you about nanoparticles is that they can have these exquisite shapes. So what is just the role of shape? Shape is important in the absence of any other interactions because then all that you have is entropy in the system. And it is often, we often associate entropy with disorder, but that's not the way to think about it. Entropy is about options. Systems that want to maximize entropy want to maximize their options, and sometimes the way to do that is by maximizing the disorder in the system. But in fact, sometimes ordering the system can provide more entropy than staying disordered. And that has been known since, since the time of Ansagar and, and Kirkwood um, in, the, in the middle 19, uh, 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 20th century. Um, 
in looking at you know, heart, colloidal spheres, it underlies all of colloid science and liquid crystal science and liquid crystal displays. But what we did is we said, well, let's look at these tetrahedra um, and uh, do a Monte Carlo simulation on the left. And we had no idea what to expect. And out came this really complicated structure that we then identified as a 12-fold symmetric, uh, rotationally symmetric uh, quasi-crystal. So a quasi-crystal is one of the most complex structures um, possible. The discovery of quasi-crystals by Dan Sheckman in 1984 was just a, a, a celebrated with the Nobel Prize in, in chemistry in 2011. They're mostly found in metals. There's a handful of them found in soft matter uh, micellar type, type systems. We never expected to see it here. It's the first example of a quasi-crystal formed from, with, with solely entropy and no other interactions um, in the system. What's interesting about quasi-crystals is that they're clearly some kind of pattern. They're clearly some kind of order um, in the system, but there is actually no repeat unit. So it's not a proper periodic crystal. It has long-range rotational symmetry, but no long-range translational order. So we said, all right, well, <laughs> is, that just, is, is that just a fluke? Or, you know, what, is it, or is it perhaps the tip of the iceberg? And so we started changing the shapes of the particles. And, uh, and we found that by, uh, by just simply changing the shape, we could get all kinds of structures that were isostructural to atomic crystal structures, um, like diamond, like high-pressure lithium, like BCC phases. So that was a study of one shape. And then we did a study of, of, a, of a series of shapes by just truncating the, the shape of the particle. Then we went and did 145 shapes and, uh, and found all sorts of, of different crystal structures, hundreds of crystal structures. We were able to, to categorize them, to classify them. And by classifying them, we were able to learn something about the relationship of shape to the structures that, that form. And here's just a sample of the shapes, but I'll go through it quickly. And in particular, because we had all this data, which we never would have been able to have a few years ago, because we didn't have the compute power, we now have a, a, are developing a theory by which the entropy of a system associated with the particle shape that emerges upon crowding gives rise to directional and tropic forces that serve to drive assembly. And this is leading to a new paradigm, a new knob to tune uh, for, for self-assembly. Now, of course, we can do 55,000 shapes. So, uh, so you know, we can just start to get all this data. And, and also, like we heard this morning from, from Henry, what do we do with all this data? Um, a colleague of mine published a 170-page supplementary information to a journal of computational physics, journal of chemical physics article, listing all the different structures for different shapes um, and, and all of the packing fractions. But that's not useful to us. We need to find a different way. We need to have databases. We need to have like a protein database for, for nanoparticles. So this is something where bioinformatics and biology is so far ahead of material science, but this is where we're going to with, with materials um, genomics. Um, I will skip this um, and just uh, mention that the vision, because I see I'm out of time, uh, that the vision for all of this is, um, is really to, to start from a target from target properties of behavior, understand what is the structure that will give us that, or the set of structures that will give us that. Inverse design what the building blocks should be. Um, uh, predict all of the assembly pathways to see you know, which of these, if, if you have uh, you know, seven different building blocks that will all self-assemble the same structure, which ones do it with high yield? Which ones do it with, a, with, with high reliability and, and predictivity? We can do rapid screening to see how fast, what quality of crystals we get. Optimize the pathway and, can, and, 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 and go through this kind of design loop so that we can do, um, do uh, digital discovery and design for, for materials on demand. This is all going to be made possible through new supercomputers. And if I can take one um, second, I want to leave you uh, with this vision that may, seem, may look familiar to, to many of you, which really sums up where we're going. Thank you. I must say, Professor, your knowledge of engineering is most impressive. Yes, back home we call him the miracle worker. Indeed. <laughs> uh, may I offer you something, gentlemen? Dr. Nichols, I might be able to offer something to you. Yes? 
I notice you're still working with polymers. Still? What, what else would I be working with? Aye, what else indeed? I'll put it another way. How thick would a piece of your plexiglass need to be at 60 feet by 10 feet to withstand the pressure of 18,000 cubic feet of water? Oh, that's easy. Six inches. We carry stuff that big in stock. I have noticed. Now suppose, just suppose, I were to show you a way to manufacture a wall that would do the same job, but be only one inch thick. Would that be worth something to you, eh? <laughs> You're joking. Perhaps a professor could use your computer. Please. Computer? Computer? Ah. Hello, computer. Just use the keyboard. The keyboard? How quaint. Transparent aluminum? That's the ticket, laddie. Okay, thank you very much. So you have some... So that's what we're, we're, we're doing that now. I mean, so that's, you know, that's a, whole, a new area that people are starting to get into now only because we have the compute power to do it. So ideally you would not have metastable states be, be uh, you know, a bug. You want to turn it into a feature. You'd like to actually engineer in metastable states that might be desirable. Maybe you want to switch between one metastable state and another for reconfigurable properties, for shape-shifting materials. So this is something now that we can start to do, you know, real-time nucleation and growth studies, and there's new instrumentation now that can actually monitor in situ uh, with dynamic in situ TEM and, uh, and dynamic in situ X-ray scattering actually follow the nucleation and growth process and start to validate these models. It'll help so, so much coming. in the lab and we have this. It sounds great. Do you have a plan in place for connecting properties in the structure? So for instance, they have used neural networks to uh, determine the conductivity of a material without actually knowing structure, just based on the stoichiometry. But those methods are, well, they're subject to getting trapped in metastable minima as well. So how do you actually, how are you going to do that? So the, you're absolutely right. I didn't even address the connecting the properties to the structure. I already assumed that someone told me that we know what's the structure that you want for certain properties. But I think that you're right, machine learning neural networks are going to come in in both of these places. They're going to start, they're, we're going to train uh, a material, a structure to, to find, to, to optimize on a certain property. And then we can train a set of building blocks to optimize the assembly of, of the structure. How are you going to get unstuck from the metastable minimum? There's no, those neural network algorithms, like genetic algorithms, they get stuck. Sure, but that's part of the learning process. So, so if they get stuck, now we can go in and understand why are they getting stuck and what, what do we need to change to get them to get unstuck but still retain the target uh, you know, global equilibrium that we want to get to. So that's one of the goals of this, of this approach of trying to do assembly engineering um, rather than just study, you know, particular, particular building blocks. I mean, all of the structures, for example, that I, that I showed, all of them are thermodynamic global equilibrium structures, to the best of our knowledge. 
we can do free energy calculations, compare it to other candidate structures. Sometimes we get metastable structures and they're robust, but then they will, if we wait long enough, they go. So for, for the simulations, getting stuck in metastable traps isn't such a problem. And because we're mimicking, in many cases, experimental conditions, it may not be a problem experimentally either. Thanks. So it looked to me like you were generating new shapes and whatever with your computer while we were watching that. And the question relates to how is intellectual property dealt with here? Can you patent all of those things that you just generated? Uh, is, is a Monsanto effect going to happen where all of a sudden billions of images and shapes and potential things are out there, but they already own the intellectual property to them? That's a very interesting question of which I really cannot speak to because we make nothing and so we patent nothing. Um, but it is true that many of these processes for, uh, you know, for making particular types of nanoparticles that have particular properties are something that, that academics and, and research labs companies are, are, are patenting. Yeah. When, I, I, I want to go back to the metastability question. Um, uh, back even to your very first slide, you talk about the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, maybe in the Silicon Age. In all of those cases, the thing that made the age possible, in fact, was metastability. It is that steel is different from iron. Mm -hmm. Iron is better in its defects than, than, than bronze. Bronze is not copper, and that's, again, because of defects. Um, so I do worry a little bit that sort of going for just what's the final stable structure really throws out uh, the wisdom of the Bronze Age, the Steel mm -hmm. Age, and, uh, and the whole subject of metallurgy. Certainly, yeah. No, I didn't. <laughs> So I didn't mean to, uh, to, to give the impression that you're only after the final equilibrium structure. What you want is to understand what are the structures that are possible. I mean, you, you could start out by, by the forward problem of giving these building blocks, what are all the structures that are possible, metastable, stable, or otherwise? Um, you know, what are all the different glasses you can get? You can ask all those questions. But if you want to design something, if, if you want a structure, whether the structure is metastable or stable, you, can, you could still work backwards to design those building blocks and the assembly pathway that will get you to these different phases. Defects in, 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 in equilibrium materials are critical to the properties of, 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 of materials, to the functioning of devices. But now we have the ability to design in those defects and optimize their location, optimize the, 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 the way that the defects are distributed through the material. And that's an opportunity that, we, uh, that, the, that this community hasn't had before. <laughs> 